This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 16, Hebrews chapters 8 and 9. Resume teachings about Jesus as royal priest, part 2. Hi, my name's Herb Bateman, and uh, we're going to resume our study of uh, Hebrews uh, today in uh, Hebrews 8 and 9. And uh, this is the uh, uh, still part of the section that I have entitled, Resume Teachings About Jesus as Royal Priest. If you recall, the last time we talked about uh, chapter 7, where the uh, author uh, expands his discussion about Melchizedek. He began with just uh, a historical overview, then he did an interpretation of uh, Melchizedek, and then did an application. Uh, today we want to look at Hebrews chapter 8, uh, verses 1 through 18. And here, the main point is Jesus and his royal priesthood. Um, he's drawing upon the exaltation of Jesus that, uh, from, that we've seen on several occasions in the book of Hebrews, uh, Psalm 110.1. Um, we saw it first mentioned in chapter 1, and then uh, 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 the author places Jesus in the, in the transcendent uh, heavens where he performs his ministry in 8, 1 to 6. So right off the bat, the first six verses, we're going to see Jesus um, in the heavenlies uh, in this uh, uh, performing his ministry uh, in the heavenlies, and this psalm is being applied to him. Uh, one aspect of that ministry is that he mediates a better covenant. So the author takes some time to contrast the, the old covenant with the new. So let's go ahead and begin um, uh, by looking at the first half of this chapter, by looking at Jesus' ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. Jesus' ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, verses 1 through 6. And the main point of these verses is simply this. Jesus' service, or Jesus' ministry, as God's royal high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, is superior to both the Levitical priest's ministry in the earthly sanctuary and the Mosaic law that regulates those activities. So the first thing we see in the first three verses is a, a description of Jesus' service as royal priest. Jesus is God's royal priest who presently serves in God's presence, having already made his offerings. Let's look at this first three verses of chapter 8. Now, the main point of what we are saying is simply this. We have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the sanctuary and the true tabernacle that the Lord, not man, set up. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So this one, too, had to have something to offer. So the first thing that we see, we, we notice, is the emphasis on the fact that Jesus has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And of course, we saw that in Hebrews uh, 1.13. Uh, actually, we saw it in Hebrews uh, 1.3, then 1.13, and this uh, emphasis of him having sat down. But here, the emphasis is given to the fact that not just he sat down at the right hand of the Father, but um, he has sat down uh, on the throne. who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. And so we see an emphasis here where and it's not just he has sat down, which in, in, uh, in figurative language, to sit at the right hand of God often uh, was a way of demonstrating authority uh, in the ancient Near East. Uh, and uh, that is being picked up here. But typically, the ancient Near East's kings didn't literally sit next to a, a god. Jesus, however, is 
depicted as quite literally sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is at the right hand of God. Thus, the Son has been invited by Yahweh and is in Yahweh's heavenly presence. Whereas the context in 1.13 focuses attention on the Son's royal kingship, here in 8.1, the context is the Son's royal priesthood. As royal priest, he sits in God's heavenly court. Um, whereas Yahweh was literally enthroned in heaven, the depiction of an Old Testament king sitting at Yahweh's right hand was figurative. It was only sim symbolic. It was a symbolized, honored position to demonstrate a unique relationship between God and king. But in Hebrews 8, the son's literal presence in heaven at the right hand um, not only describes the son's honored position with God, but also his authority as royal priest. So the royal priesthood is a theme that is unique to Hebrews. Um, his place of service, well, he's a minister. He applies... To, uh, uh, to do administrative duties that are cultic-related. Uh, the focus upon the son's administrative cult of function as servant or minister of the heavenly sanctuary. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the tabernacle later on, but just let me say that at this point, um, there's going to be a difference in an emphasis between an earthly tabernacle and a heavenly tabernacle, which we'll look at uh, as we continue to move um, move on in our study today. Let's look at the service. Let's look at verses 4 and 5 and look at the service in this earthly uh, tabernacle. On earth, when Jesus in his incarnation was here serving, he was ineligible or ineligible to serve as high priest or any priestly function because of the present existence of priests serving in an earthly tabernacle that warranted you to be from a tribe of Levi. So uh, there's going to be an emphasis here in verse 4 about earthly priests and then uh, earthbound service. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest since there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by law. The place where they serve is a pattern and shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. Just as Moses was warned by God as he was about to complete the tabernacle, for he says, see that you make everything according to the example shown to you. And of course, this is a quote from Exodus 25, um, 25, 40. Now, this idea of a shadow, um, it's a term that refers to an object uh, uh, and thereby creates more than a, uh, more of a copy, or, or it creates a mere copy or a representation of something that's real. In Hebrews 8.5, the tent, that tabernacle uh, erected by Moses, is a mere copy of the greater or real heavenly sanctuary. So uh, there's an emphasis on the fact that there is a heavenly sanctuary. In much the same way as there's a heavenly place of rest, there is a heavenly sanctuary. And the one that, that Moses created in the wilderness is just a copy of that heavenly sanctuary. The earthly uh, and heavenly dichotomy that the author develops here and elsewhere in Hebrews is not unique to Jewish thinking. A heavenly temple is, exp is expressed uh, several places in Jewish uh, literature. And uh, I expound that a little bit more in my commentary on Hebrews that's coming out in the uh, Kriegel K. Rooks commentary series. Um, Philo, uh, however, and I'll just uh, pause to say a little about Philo. Um, Philo's portrayal of the heavenly temple tends to be much more complex than those found in Hebrews. Uh, they share a common tradition with other Jewish literature, uh, but it is greater and more perfect, uh, but his emphasis uh, is that it's greater and more perfect than the, uh, the earthly tabernacle. So I just want to leave you with this idea that this idea, this concept within Judaism uh, about a heavenly tabernacle, it's not unique. It is it is, it is uh, very much part and parcel of their tradition. 
Yet the author of Hebrews interprets the, and transforms this dichotomy to include the dichotomy that exists between Judaism as an old form of, uh, uh, of a, well, I'll just say, an old form of religion, and Christianity that's a new form. Uh, it resumes an, argu an argument that's already pre been presented in chapter 7. Um, Melchizedek, Jesus, is in the order of Melchizedek. He's superior. He's greater. His priesthood is greater than the Levitical priesthood. And so we've got this dichotomy being, uh, again, uh, uh, emphasized, uh, where Jesus' ministry is being compared and contrasted with the Levitical priesthood, Levitical ministry, to demonstrate the greatness of the superiority of Jesus as both priest and his service. Um, so now let's go and, uh, and look at what Hebrews has to say about his service in the heavenly uh, sanctuary. Uh, but now Jesus has obtained a superior ministry since the covenant that he mediates is also better and is enacted on better promises. So now we're talking about covenant again. Now, the mention of covenant, this is the first time we've seen this. I mean, uh, 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 well, let, let's just talk about covenant to begin with. The concept of a covenant in, uh, in Judaism, the Jewish concept of covenant, denotes a special kind of relationship believed to exist between the one and only God and the nation of Israel. Uh, the idea of covenant uh, decisively makes the covenant relationship between Israel and God uh, asymmetrical in that it is initiated, implemented, and governed by God alone. The author of Hebrews likewise speaks of God's initiated and implemented government, covenants. And he mentions the Davidic covenant in chapter 1, 2 Samuel 7, 14. He mentions the Abrahamic covenant in uh, in 6.13, and now he's spending time to discuss the New Covenant, the New Covenant as it's presented uh, in verses 7 through 13. And so what, we, what Jesus is seen as mediating is a superior covenant, a new covenant, one that's going to replace the old. So we read in uh, chapter 8, verses 7 to 13, there is the focus of, uh, or focus on old and new covenant. For if the first covenant, now I, let's pause and let's just get this clear. We're not talking first, the very first covenant God ever made because that is Noah's covenant. That's the covenant that he made with Noah. Might, one might even argue the covenant, uh, first covenant may be as early back as well, the one between Adam and Eve. Uh, uh, um, but we, we, we're safe to at least say that there clearly is a covenant with regards to Noah. Uh, the others are more implicitly implied instead of explicitly stated. Uh, but here, what uh, the author of Hebrews is concerned about is the Mosaic Covenant. So that we're talking about the Mosaic Covenant had been faultless. And we're going to see uh, it saying, if that covenant had been faultless, just assume that it is, no one would have to look for a second one. Okay. And so we have God speaking uh, to them, but showing its faults, showing the faults of the Mosaic Covenant. This is what God says, and he's going to quote from Jeremiah. Look, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will complete a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Why? Because they did not continue in my covenant, and I had no regard for them. That's interesting. He had no regard for them. He, uh, he uh, turned his back on them, uh, we might say, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will establish with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. I will inscribe them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And there will be no need at all for each one to teach his countrymen or each one to teach his brother, saying, Know the Lord, since they will all know me, from the least 
to the greatest. For I will be merciful towards their evil deeds, and, and their sins I will remember no longer. When he speaks of a new covenant, he makes the first obsolete. Now, what is growing obsolete and aging is about to disappear. Now, there's several uh, significant things that are, that are going here. Uh, first, we see the promise of a new covenant um, in verses 8 through 12 that I've read, and uh, where God condemned the people of Israel for their perpetual breaking of that covenant. We have God promising to do something uh, about the problem of these lawbreakers, covenant breakers, and God promising that he would establish a new covenant. Um, this, uh, I think, is pretty significant once again to talk about and point out that we see a passage of scripture where it is clearly said, God says, God is speaking. Um, we see uh, that uh, this first comes up in chapter 1 where he says, and to which of the angels has God said, and quotes scripture. Then we see this idea of God speaking to the community uh, in 3.1 with regards to Psalm 95. Now we have God speaking uh, uh, to the, the nation of Israel about how he's going to have a new covenant. So we see God speaking and involved in his, with his people. And so we have God again speaking. Thus, unlike the old covenant engraved on tablets, this new covenant, says God, is going to be inscribed on their hearts. And sins are effectively going to be forgiven. The new covenant is going to be different from the Old Covenant. Um, so the qualities of this new, to, uh, new covenant are emphasized in verses uh, 10, to, 10 to 12. Um, it's going to be new. It's going to be made with the nation. It's going to be internalized. Um, it's going to be, uh, it's going to teach people uh, about the covenant. Uh, the teaching of this covenant is going to be unnecessary. Um, People will know God. God will be merciful to his people. And God's people will have no sin. They will be forgiven. And the effects of all this is the obsolete or the putting aside of the old covenant. Um, this term obsolete, the verb obsolete, to make obsolete, occurs several times in the New Testament. Uh, but it was first introduced in Hebrews uh, 1.11 where uh, in Psalm 102, it speaks about how creation will uh, be obsolete or will roll away, uh, but um, God will not or the Son will not. Creation will grow old, but the Son will not. Uh, in, in this section, this uh, verb occurs twice. And unlike in 111, where the earth is compared to worn out clothing, here the first covenant is just depicted as old. It's old. God has made the first covenant obsolete. Well, King James says old. Uh, NIV, the Net Bible, says obsolete. We might say God's uh, event is in process. Um, the first is becoming obsolete, it's growing old, it's out of date. In both cases, however you want to say it, um, it's clear that by setting up this new covenant, God has declared the first covenant as past its prime. Its purpose is no longer valid, and therefore the law is obsolete. And then he moves, how, moves into how it's going to disappear, or as the as the Net Bible has translated uh, this, this obsolete old Mosaic law is old. Therefore, it's going to disappear. Although this noun may at times convey the idea of being destroyed, destruction, um, that's probably an overstatement. Generally, uh, we, the noun is understood as just something that disappears. It just vanishes. Uh, it just put aside. 
There's nothing in the context to suggest that God's pronouncement of a, a violent judgment, but just merely that uh, the idea is just, uh, it's sort of along this saying that we typically have, out with the old, in with the new. Out with the old. Out with that Mosaic covenant. It, it, it didn't work, uh, didn't work well. God, you know, it wasn't perfect. Uh, but let's bring in this new covenant. There's a new covenant. It's far better. So that's, uh, that's chapter 8. Chapter 8 uh, focuses on the covenants, the Mosaic covenant versus the new covenant, where the new covenant is demonstrated as being far superior to the old covenant and how this old covenant, that Mosaic covenant, is obsolete, um, it's old, and it's going to disappear. It has no value in this new era. So now we move on to uh, chapter 9. Now, um, chapter 9 uh, spends, uh, spends most of the time, the topic, the subject of chapter 9 is the tabernacle. And these chapters divide out pretty nicely. 7, the subject of, is Melchizedek and how Jesus is uh, uh, spoken of of being uh, a royal priest in the order of Melchizedek. It's about Melchizedek. In uh, chapter 8, the subject of chapter 8 is covenant. And now we're in chapter 9. Now we're moving to the tabernacle. The subject of chapter 9 is the tabernacle. And uh, chapter 9 is divided into four parts, four sections. Um, first, there's a discussion of the earthly tabernacle. Then it moves to uh, the arrival of Jesus as royal priest, which focuses on Jesus' entry into the heavenly tabernacle. Then um, it moves to concerns about Jesus as the mediator of a new covenant. So we, we're seeing the new covenant being added in here. And then finally, there's the concerns about Jesus fulfilling God's requirement whereby the author concentrates and purifies the earthly tabernacle with what the heavenly tabernacle with the heavenly tabernacle. So how does the earthly tabernacle get purified? How does that is similar or contrasting this heavenly tabernacle? So let's just go ahead and look at Hebrews uh, chapter 9, the first 10 verses. And this is where uh, the author of Hebrews merely describes the tabernacle. And the point is simply this for these 10 verses. While concealing the heavenly tabernacle, the earthly tabernacle, the one that Moses saw it a shadow of that he mimics and creates uh, here on earth, the earthly tabernacle with its outer and inner chambers and their respective furnishings serve as the place for earthly priests to officiate continual worship as well as the place for earthly high priest to sacrifice yearly. So we begin with a description of the earthly tabernacle in verses 1 to 5, where worship occurs and, where, uh, and how this tabernacle is developed or divided into chambers. Now the first covenant, once again, we've already talked about the first covenant as being the Mosaic covenant, not a covenant beyond that or earlier than that. The first covenant, in fact, had regulations for worship and its earthly sanctuary. For a tent was prepared, the outer one, which contained the lampstand, the table, and the representation of the loaves. This is called the holy place. And after the second curtain, there was a tent called the Holy of Holies. It contained the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered entirely with gold. In this Ark were the golden urn containing the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the stone of tablets of the covenant. And above the ark, there were cher cher uh, cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Now is not the time to speak of these things in any detail. So he's, he's just describing uh, the tabernacle uh, as it's uh, presented in Exodus. Um, it's not unusual to see a description of this tabernacle in other writings. 
Um, Josephus also makes descriptions of the tabernacle. And, and just to keep things simple for this uh, discussion, uh, it's, you know, the tabernacle, what they're talking about is the, the tent in, in the center. Uh, generally, the, the tabernacle had a fence around it. And, and you walk through a gate, and the first thing you would see would be the brazen altar followed by the laver. Then there was the tent, and that tent is divided into two parts. And the first part was approximately um, 50 feet by 25 feet, and it had some furniture, the lampstand, the table of showbread. Then there's the Holy of Holies, and that's approximately 25 feet square where the, where the um, Ark of the Covenant resided. And so he's just making, uh, just describing this tabernacle. Uh, and the outer chamber, the first, uh, uh, when you, that first chamber that is 25 feet by 50 feet, um, is separated from the Holy of Holies with a curtain. You have to go through a curtain to get into this tabernacle to begin with. Then there's another subsequent cur cur curtain that separated um, the first inner sanctuary from the second one, the Holy of Holies. So there's referencing to the veil, to this curtain. Now, um, the author makes mention of the veil several times uh, in, in, in the book. Uh, we saw this used in Hebrews 6.19. Um, it was a way of describing a, the hope, and hope is personified in Hebrews 6.19 as being something that's beyond the veil. Hope is personified as being something that is on the other side of the veil, behind the veil. So whereas in 6.19, hope is personified as having entered behind the veil of this innermost part of God's uh, tabernacle, the, the Holy of Holies. Here, uh, the veil is quite literally the thing that separates the Holy of Holies from the first chamber of that tabernacle. And this is going to come up again later on, uh, so I want to make sure that I, I make mention of it. Uh, hope, I mean this veil, uh, hope is seen as going beyond that veil, personified as being on the other side of that veil in the Holy of Holies. And uh, here it's focus, focusing on the veil that actually separates the inner chamber from the outer. Um, then the author moves into uh, what probably is a little bit more important is the service in the tabernacle in verses 6 to 10. Um, service that occurs in the outer chamber and then limitations uh, of this. Oh, and then service about, uh, that happened within the inner chamber. So let's look at Hebrews 6, uh, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. So with these things prepared like this, this inner and outer, uh, this inner and outer uh, chambers, these two chambers, the priests enter continually into the outer tent as they perform their duties. But only the high priest enters once a year into the inner tent, the Holy of Holies, and not without blood that he offers for himself and the heirs of the people. So we have two chambers. The first chamber that you go into, all the priests are functioning in there. But it's only the high priest that goes into that inner sanctuary, that holy of holies. And he does it once a year uh, uh, to offer um, sacrifices for himself and then for the people. Um, and this is uh, what is known as the Day of Atonement. Um, then he moves on to talking about the limitations of these priestly uh, functions within the earthly tabernacle. Um, the Holy Spirit reveals that the way to the inner sanctuary in heaven is concealed while the earthly tabernacle still stands. Um, so let's, let's look at uh, this and see if we can't... Um, uh, flesh this out a little bit, verses 7 through 10. But only the high priest enters once a year into the inner, inner tent, um, and the Holy Spirit making it clear that the way into the holy place had not yet appeared 
as long as the old tabernacle was standing. This was a symbol for the time when present. This was a symbol for the time then present when gifts and sacrifices were offered that could not perfect the conscience of the work of the worshiper. They had served only for matters of food and drink and various washings. They are external regulations imposed until a new order came. So here we have this, uh, we have this presentation of God creating a sacrificial system, uh, a place where sacrificial system could uh, um, be uh, maintained and practiced, knowing that um, it really wasn't going to uh, necessarily do the job. It was, it, but it was a foreshadowing of things to come. And this is, again, where we have some ambiguity in God's program. I, I can't explain why he just didn't just fix it right from the very beginning. But he didn't. And so he, he allows this imperfect system to take place. And though it's imperfect, People trusted this fact, that as imperfect as that system might be, I'm trusting that if I practice this imperfect system, it does please God, I can have a relationship with God. I don't understand how it works out. I don't understand how it pans out. But I'm trusting that since this is the plan that God has established for us at this time, I'm going to follow it, as imperfect as that might be. And quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot that we don't even understand about the fulfillment of Jesus coming and the coming of Jesus and fulfilling these covenants. There's things in the future we just don't understand, but we trust God. Ultimately, it's our trusting in God's promises, and trusting in what God says, trusting in what God has put before us in Scripture. And so as imperfect as this system was, the limitations that this system had it was what God had put into place until he sent his son. Which brings us to the arrival of Jesus as high priest, verses 11 to 14. 11 to 14, the focus of 11 to 14 is... Uh, is Jesus. And, and the point of this section is simply this. After Jesus arrived in heaven as high priest, he entered into the heavenly tabernacle, and he, made a, and he made a single blood offering which guaranteed the cleansing of one's conscience. So here we have in, in uh, verse 11 uh, a description of Jesus entering into the heavenly tabernacle, followed by a contrast of offerings that existed, and then a moving to the guarantee of Jesus' sacrifice as you can take it to the bank. Let's, let's read these verses as they uh, appear from verses 11 to uh, 14. But now Christ, now Messiah, has come as the high priest, the royal high priest of the good things to come, he passed through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Once again, the emphasis is on a heavenly tabernacle that uh, exists in heaven that is perfect, not one that's just a mere shadow of something that exists in heaven. And he entered once for all the most holy place, not by the blood of goats, and calves, but by his own blood. So he himself secured eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a young cow sprinkled on those who are defiled, consecrated them, and provided ritual purity, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God. So here we have a, a lesser to greater argument occurring. We have this imperfect system that God put into place 
that was supposed to be uh, practice, honored, in order to demonstrate a loyalty and a relationship with God. And as imperfect as that was, um, uh, if that worked in the past, how much greater will this new process work? And so we have a lesser to greater argument. How much more will the blood of Jesus, if the blood of bulls and goats uh, served as a symbol of, of, uh, of cleansing, how much greater will the blood of Messiah be and, and actually do cleanse and purify, not outwardly, but inwardly. So we have Jesus' offerings for the tabernacle. He arrives in heaven to provide eternal redemption, a purification of the conscience, a promise of an, inter of an eternal inheritance, the forgiveness of sins. These are all things that 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 um, that ha uh, these are all the benefits of his sacrifice. In contrast to um, uh, the earthly uh, uh, practices, uh, animals, blood sacrifices needed to be repeated year after year after year. The emphasis is when, when Jesus does his sacrifice, it's once for all. No longer needed to be repeated. Which raises up and makes it really evident that the that they knew it was, the people of the Old Testament knew it was not perfect because they had to do it year after year after year. Um, but when it comes and when you look at a contrast between Jesus and the Old Covenant and the, the practice of blood sacrificing, Jesus did it once and that's it. His sacrifice is superior. And then finally, there's a guarantee Unlike animal blood offerings, Jesus' single offering of his own blood guarantees a cleansing of the conscience, which we read in 13 and 14. It is assumed that the blood of bulls and goats were sufficient for the cleansing of flesh, ashes for the sanctifying of flesh, um, but it's Jesus' blood that guarantees the cleansing of the conscience. The Old Testament blood sacrifices did nothing for the conscience. Now, having, having moved from a discussion and a, a description of the covenant, I mean of the tabernacle, the earthly tabernacle, to the arrival of Jesus as high priest, the author now moves to uh, the fact that Jesus is a mediator of a new covenant. So we're coming back to the new covenant. And... Um, and the author is going to begin by revealing what God's intention is for this new covenant. And the point of these verses, verses 15 to 22, is simply this. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant because his blood, his death, activated a new covenant. Just as blood, just as death activates an everyday will and was used to activate, it was also used to activate this new covenant. So we see God's intention uh, identified right off the bat in verse 15. Verse 15 we read, And so he is the mediator of a new covenant with this result. Those who are called may receive the eternal inheritance he has promised, since he died to set them free from the violations committed under the first covenant. So we, we right off the bat, God's intention for making Jesus the, this mediator of the new covenant is based upon the fact that God's people receive an inheritance because of God's blood. We are sons of promise. And we are sons of promise because of Jesus and what he has done. G God in chapter 1 describes, or a the author of Hebrews in chapter 1 disguises Jesus as being heir. And we are joint heirs with Jesus. Um, this uh, idea of mediating a new covenant, um, the point uh, about Jesus as a mediator of this covenant, better covenant, is because God declared that Jesus' sacrifice to be more effective than those offered during the previous era. It's not because I say so. It's not because your pastor says so. It's because God has said so. 
God has declared that the sacrifice of Jesus has made it possible uh, for the uh, cleansing of the eternal conscience. The details and how it works out, I have no idea. Through his spirit, and we can theologize it and put it in systematic terms, but as far as how it works, it's as, mu as much a mystery to me as it is about the spirit coming and going uh, that is oftentimes described in John. There's, there's a lot that we can theorize, there's a lot that we can speculate about, um, but ultimately, I trust in the fact God said that Jesus' sacrifice redeemed you, purchased you, and made you an heir of the kingdom. And therefore, I am partners with other people who share and believe this message about the messianic son of promise. I am partners with, with Jesus, as a result of this work and believing that he is God's man to accomplish and fulfill uh, the promises of God based upon God's appointment, appointment. And I am partners with the Spirit of God because of his work, his activities. God's intention for people to receive these eternal, internal, eternal inheritance is because Jesus bought their freedom with his blood. And we've been set free because of it. Set free from the bondage of sin. We can say, as Paul would say, we can say no to sin. We don't have to submit to sin. Verses 16 and 17, um, the author uh, talks about uh, the exclusion of covenants. Uh, where, uh, you know, covenants, I've already mentioned, covenants were like wills uh, in that they were inaugurated. They were set into motion. And beneficiaries receive their inheritance once that will is inaugurated. Um, I have a will. But, um, and though my, my daughter will be the beneficiary of that will, that will does not take place and will not be activated until I die. It's the same type of situation here. Uh, a covenant, a will has been determined by God and it was activated with and by the work of Jesus. Verse seven, uh, verses uh, 16 and 17. For where there is a will, the death of the one who made it must be proven. For a will takes effect only at death, since it carries no force while the one who made it is still alive. So then we come into this inaugurating of this first covenant in verses 18 through 22. So even the first covenant was inaugurated with blood. For when Moses had spoken every command to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hessop uh, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has commanded you to keep. And both the tabernacle and all the utensils of worship he likewise sprinkled with blood. Indeed, according to the law, almost everything was purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, even if it's symbolic. So it was necessary for the patterns of things in heaven to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves required a better sacrifice, better sacrifices than these. So he moves from uh, the first covenant and the inauguration of that first covenant through the blood of bulls and goats, uh, a sequence of events, and then speaks about the significance of death in order to inaugurate those things. But then he moves into talking about the requirements that Jesus fulfills. And we've already begun reading that in verse three, uh, 23. We're moving into how it is that, that uh, the author has demonstrated how uh, covenants are inaugurated by blood. And in the Old Testament, when it came to the Mosaic Law, the Mosaic Covenant, that covenant was inaugurated with blood, and, and it symbolized forgiveness. Now he's going to move into talking about Jesus fulfilling the requirement in a way far superior to the sacrifices of the Old Testament. Verse 23 tells us, 
For Christ did not enter the sanctuary made, oh, 23. So it was necessary for the patterns of the things in heaven to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves required a better sacrifice. For Christ, Messiah, did not enter a sanctuary made with hands, the representation of the true sanctuary, but to heaven itself. And he appears now in God's presence for us. And he did not enter to offer himself again and again and again and again and again, the way the high priest enters the sanctuary year after year after year after year with the blood of goats, bulls and goats. But he offered it with his own blood. For then he would have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the consummation of the age to put away sin by his sacrifice. And just as people are appointed to die once and then to face judgment, so also after Messiah was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly await him, he will appear a second time to bear sin not to bear sin, but to bring salvation. So we have an already not yet tension occur occurring. We saw the already not yet tension of Jesus ruling, but yet not ruling. We see an already not yet tension concerning saved, but yet a future aspect of salvation yet to come. We are saved. We experience forgiveness. We know of forgiveness, but there's an already aspect of forgiveness with, an, with a future aspect of forgiveness yet to come. There's an already aspect of of uh, salvation, but a future aspect of salvation. And so uh, we have contrasting requirements in the tabernacle that we've seen here in verse 23. We've seen several reasons for this requirement of Jesus. Uh, it's uh, the heavenly uh, tabernacle is not a symbolic tabernacle. Um, the uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not a symbolic presence uh, in contrast to entering the symbolic presence of God. Jesus quite literally entered into uh, God's presence. Remember, they entered into a holy of holy and there was just a box there. Jesus entered the real holy of holies where God the Father resides, where the cherubim and seraphim worship him. It wasn't symbolic presence of God, but Jesus entered uh, into the real presence. And it's not a symbolic repeated sacrifice. It's a once for all sacrifice. And the effects of this sacrifice, the effects of, uh, of um, Jesus um, doing this once for all uh, sacrifice, it eliminated the need for animal sacrifices and it was eternally effective. Unlike people who are appointed to die time and time again, Jesus was appointed to die um, for the sins of many people. And then, re and then he is expected to return. Uh, and we eagerly re await his return so that we can fully experience the consummation of our salvation fully experience redemption, fully experience um, our membership as God's, uh, as part of, um, of his family, to fully experience that place of rest uh, that we spoke of uh, in chapter uh, four, that heavenly place of rest where we will celebrate God and his created order and celebrate him for what he has done uh, on our behalf. We await the return of our divinely appointed messianic son of promise who has fulfilled God's promises. It's no mistake, uh, there's no mistaking the fact that um, Jesus is God's man, the one through whom God has spoken and the one through whom God has fulfilled his promises the promises made to Abraham, the promises made to David, and the promises made to the nation of Israel concerning a New Testament, a new covenant. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me encourage you to um, 
walk with the king and continue to be a blessing to those that you come in contact with, knowing that um, we serve a, a, a risen king. Have a great day. This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 16, Hebrews chapters 8 and 9. Resume teachings about Jesus as royal priest, part 2. Mm -hmm.